It's good to be back. And why I picked Job, I really don't know. Whether it's the spirits leading or someone else interfering. But if you would go to Job 19, uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter as the bulletin might indicate. I'm just going to read from 23 to 27. I know one reason I know these words are because my, these were, this was my mom's second favorite scripture text. I heard it endlessly every time you hear Handel's Messiah. Darlene, you want to come up and sing it a minute? It's a, my dad had a, an adaptation for the baritone. I know that my Redeemer liveth uh, with the old King James and though worms destroy this body, which is a bad translation apparently. But uh, we're going to just read 23 through 27, and I would also hope that any trained theologians tonight forgive my attempts, clumsy as they will be, to get a handle on what redeemed all entails. So verse 23 of Job 19, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. And that's the section we're going to focus on tonight. I try to think of any story or any man like Job, and I can't come up with one. As a kid, I was mystified by the sheer volume of his troubles. Uh, to this young kid, you know, dying would be horrible. The loss of barns and animals, probably even worse. Sitting in sackcloth, and ashes was vile. Being barked at by your wife was abysmal, though I'd come to find out it's just a normal part of life. Experiencing piercingly miserable advice from supposed friends was beyond belief. Feeling of abandoned by God was unthinkable. But the thing I found as a kid most repugnant, the one detail that caught my youthful imagination once I had looked it up in an encyclopedia, was that he had boils festering pustules of stinking, oozing corruption, and he scraped them with broken shards of pottery, that was beyond the pale. Since then, I've deepened my appreciation of the entire story of Job, and I've moved past the boils. And so tonight, the theme is going to be Job, by a God-planted faith, relied on his Redeemer to restore him even in the worst of human circumstances. For any of you for whom the story is new, let's very quickly summarize it. Uh, the book of Job is narrative history. It's possible that Job is the oldest book of the Bible written approximately 2,000 years before Christ. Key personalities include Job, Eliphaz, the Temanite, the shortest man in the Bible, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Naamathite, and Elihu the Buzite. In Job, we see a man who allows God, who God allows to be directly attacked by Satan. He is an example of faithfulness as he loses everything important to him and yet remains faithful to God. Its purpose is to illustrate God's sovereignty and faithfulness during a time of great suffering. Uh, in chapters 1 through 3, Job tests, God tests Job's faithfulness through allowing Satan to attack him. From 4 to 37, there's this back and forth discussion between Job and his friends who give him plenty of bad advice. At the end, in chapters 38 to 42, God speaks to Job, reminds him who Job is, Reminds him who he, God, is and restores him. And in the end, Job answers by saying, I have declared that which I did not understand. And God blessed Job with twice as much as he had before his trials. So I don't want to focus tonight on the behind-the-scenes battle between God and Satan, fascinating as that would be 
I don't want to focus on the embattled God follower enduring the rebukes of his friends or the verbal blasts from his lovely wife. I don't necessarily even want to focus on God's generosity to Job at the end of the story. I would like to take a good, close look at Job's confession in the midst of the horrible tragedy of death, loss, torment, supposed abandonment by God, and boils. And even in his confession, one can imagine him wailing from the ashes as he praises God for his redemption. If you have your Bible open yet, we move a little closer from the whole book to chapter 19, and there are several pieces. The first six verses, uh, Job verbalizes his frustration with his friends, understandably so. In the second section from seven through, I don't have the last verse there, Job states what he sees as God having done to him, and he doesn't understand it. Third, Job summarizes his conditions, and then finally, after that litany of horrors, Job gives of all things a mic-dropping mic confession of God's faithfulness in our scripture tonight. We find that even in the midst of unimaginable pain and terror, Job states loudly for all to hear that God's redemption given to him by his sovereign God was the source of his confessed faith. And how is that possible? That's the question for tonight. So much for the general background and introduction. The body of this study tonight will focus on a simple key word. I always thought it was simple, and that's the word redeem, redeemed, redeemer, redemption, whichever form you wish to take. That's the key concept, the central job, the core idea of this whole book. And Job knew that his redeemer was alive. He knew that his redeemer was alive and that he would see the fruit of the redeemed redeemer relationship with his own eyes. We throw the word redeemed around quite a bit. Musical groups, songs, litanies. The word redeem is all over the Christian landscape. Growing up before learning the uh, Westminster Catechism question, who is the only redeemer of God's elect? The most common use of redeem in my life was S&H green stamps. Some of you may be old enough to remember S&H green stamps. They had in an ad, decide if you want to redeem your stamps for green points or cash. Or even more interesting, you put the stamps in something called a Green Stamps Redemption Booklet. Sounds like you're buying your way to heaven. As a sidebar, if you go to greenstamps.com, you can still do it. They still exist. So how many of us could give a good, accurate summary of what redeem or redeemer means? Maybe Pastor Zylstra could. Maybe Tom, if he's here, maybe Drew, but this gets complicated to me. Maybe I'm the only one who needs this, but let's dig into the biblical connotations and allusions of redeem. We'll see how two different, slightly different uses of redeem blend in the book of Job. So the first definition is best seen in one of the classic stories illustrating God's redeeming work. And that's found in the book of Ruth. With no male in the family, with no land that went with the family, Ruth and Naomi needed what God had set in place to care for just such people. God established several laws for just this situation. The first law was called the law of sowing and reaping from Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 24. Uh, as a reminder of their former status as slaves in Egypt, Mosaic law required landowners reap their land with only one pass. What remained was to be made available for widows and destitute to glean. And we can plug that into the story. Another law that God put in place was the law of redemption of land. 
God intended the nation of Israel to understand that the promised land was the property of God. God's gift of the use of the land was established. It was established, and you can read about that in Genesis 15, 17, 24, and Exodus 6. The land granted to the tribes was intended to remain under their stewardship. And if a Hebrew sold his land, he was merely selling a lease and intended to eventually get the land back. And Mosaic law established the process by which a male Hebrew could get land back. The male could redeem the land and determine its cost using a prescribed formula. The nearest male relative, kinsman, could redeem the land. Or the Hebrew could wait until the year of Jubilee when the ownership rights were restored. And finally, the law of the leveret. I never heard that word used before. That's Latin for brother-in-law. And under certain circumstances, a brother-in-law could use the following system, and by fulfillment of that law, it was initiated so that the widowed sister-in-law, and, and it was intended to provide a male heir for the deceased's family property and care for the mother in her old age. Three separate provisions. And Boaz took all those on as his responsibility for Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and Naomi needed a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. It gets a little fuzzy to me without knowing Hebrew, but from what I was reading in studies and commentaries, the Hebrew word for redeem is ga'al, and a redeemer was a go'el. In this case, Boaz, the go'el, performed a privilege or duty for the closest relative. The Hebrew word conveys a primary sense of restoring something to its original condition. A goel, therefore, was one who not only delivered, but who effected restoration to an original state. Keep in mind the verse from Job that we read as a text. Boaz bought them out of a sort of nothingness, a no man's land. He purchased for them, he restored for them status of being fully part of the people of God. He brought them back where they ought to have been. That's one biblical use of the word redeemer. And Christ, of course, these should be, I hope, obvious to you, functions as our kinsman redeemer, buying us back with his own blood. As, Corinthians, as in Corinthians we read, for you were bought at a price, and that was a high price, the highest possible now, definition two is from another word in Hebrew that's very similar, and it echoes the way Job uses redeemer in verse 24. One source defines the word used, meaning the release from an undesirable situation affected by some sort of intervention, or listen to this, substitutionary action. Hopefully you've heard of substitutionary atonement. This is less specifically tied to Levitical law, yet restoration by action is the process. Isaiah 44 sums up this meaning when Isaiah writes, I, God, have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. This word emphasizes liberation, procured, by the payment of a ransom. We owe, but cannot pay. Our mortgage is due, but we can't have the funds. The car loan is overdue, and threats are coming from the bank, yet we have nowhere to go for payment. Redeem here indicates an intervening action that affects a release from an undesirable condition. So to summarize both definitions and maybe blend them a bit, a redeemer is a family member who steps in to pay, to release us from a debt we have incurred but cannot repay. And this becomes an act of liberation from a wrong situation and a restoration of the way it is intended to be.
and scriptural unity here is so obvious, but I'm supposed to mention it. We bring this all together. The New Testament transparently introduces us to our ultimate Goel, our ultimate Redeemer who stood for another to defend his cause and so acquit him of all charges laid against him. According to the New Testament, Christ bought us, and that's one level of redemption. Secondly, Christ bought us out of slavery for future freedom, and that's a deeper level of, rest, of redemption. And third, Christ paid in full the debt owed and freed us from now on and forever and made us his son. As Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. Or in Titus, speaking again of Christ who gave himself for us that, we, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And Jesus, of course, fulfills all of the requirements of a Goel Redeemer perfectly. He was born a human being, therefore Jesus is a, is a blood relative of ours. Because of his sinless state, Jesus was capable of purchasing and redeeming the penalty for the sins of you and the sins of me, mine. Because of his obedience, Jesus became willing to be the Goel. And because of his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus completed the atonement and provided the means of salvation of believers. So, Back to Job. What is the point? What is the conclusion? Where do we see Job after all this? Where do, we, where do we see ourselves after all this? Remembering that our theme tonight is Job by faith relied on his Redeemer to restore him even in the worst of circumstances. We need to confront our own questions and I would ask you to consider the following. And I certainly have asked myself to consider the following. By what means do we seek goodness, wholeness, restoration? Wealth, status, family, and friends are all the wrong sources. Who would be the primary agent in gaining that wholeness and restoration? If we look to any human source, we fail. What is our response to storms and trials of life? To wrap this up, I'd like to say first, Job, hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ, knew that somehow he could rely on God for relief and restoration. Even when he was confused by what God allows, or even when God seemed distant. In fact, elsewhere in the book of Job, he clearly states his need for a mediator, an umpire, someone to step in to bring unity again, to bring relief. In numerous locations, Job undoubtedly looks to God as his advocate, his kinsman redeemer, the one who alone can bring wholeness and restoration. When we look to anything else, when we look anywhere else, we will be left wanting and unsatisfied, and in fact, we will remain unsaved. Second, Job is crystal clear that God is his only source of gaining this relief. His wealth didn't help him. It was gone. His social status as the community leader couldn't help him. He was reduced to the lowest of the low, sitting in a pile of refuse. His earthly family couldn't step in on his behalf. They were dead or bringing such great advice as curse God and die. His friends were sure of no help in bringing comfort or assistance. So his great confession 
his only resource, his ultimate foundation, was that he himself knew that his own Redeemer lives, and that he saves him. And though his earthly body and possessions may rot and wither away, he would see God. Where do you look for help? The final question again ought to cause reflection. When a loved one dies, when a job is lost, when illness comes, and when illness doesn't go away, when hard work is not rewarded, when wealth or stability fail, where do we go? And now I know why these verses came to my mind. When my mom had come out of her coma about a week before she died, she, for a few days, she woke up for reasons beyond my ken. And she couldn't talk because the tube had messed up her throat, but she was on her. And she mouthed to me, Job 19, I know that my Redeemer liveth. We have a Redeemer who rescues us. And Christ rescues us not because he had to or the law required that he do it. Jesus Christ saved us with his own blood because he chose to out of love. My prayer for all of us is that we can, sitting on our own ash heaps, Join with the God-inspired depth of Job in saying, I know that my Redeemer lives.